from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Today's uh, lecture is something uh, probably more appeal to younger people, but uh, <laughs> this is the average uh, age for this institution is 58. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's well, maybe. <laughs> um, I'm Tomoko Steen at Science, Technology, and the Business Division of the Library of Congress. Um, this event is sponsored by uh, our division, Science and Technology and Bus Business Division, and also uh, McFarland uh, Fund we have. And uh, we have a very interesting speaker today. I wake up with uh, check, uh, checking my tweet and go to bed with uh, checking a <laughs> tweet, and which my husband doesn't like. But <laughs> um, it is... The tweet is now, is, and all other Facebook, the social media became a very more serious uh, tool for the various reasons for earthquake to, for example, this um, epidemiology and uh, infectious disease monitoring. And uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Ma Dr. Um, Madoff, is the... Uh, uh, editor for probably a lot of people work on the infectious disease following this uh, information from ProMed Mail. And uh, we have information uh, handouts outside. If you are interested, please pick it up. And um, Dr. Madoff did uh, his medical degree at Tufts University and then uh, moved to, uh, with fellowship to Harvard Medical School and he served as a faculty there for many, many years and stayed on the Boston. And uh, now he is professor at uh, UMass Medical School. And while he's editor of this uh, Promet Mail, and also he served for the uh, Massachusetts um, State uh, Department, Department of Public Health. So he has three hats and uh, very busy, but uh, kindly came and shared with you all for the uh, very interesting uh, effort to monitor disease worldwide. Okay, before further ado, Dr. Madoff, please welcome him. Um, I'm going to um, touch on, on, on several things during my talk, including some disease outbreaks, and um, it would be hard not to be aware of emerging infectious diseases um, in, the last, uh, in the last few months with the um, Ebola crisis raging in, in West Africa. I understand the President is going to address that issue today. Um, and uh, we've also heard about enterovirus D68 just in the last couple of weeks, and uh, it really is is very very frequent that we hear about these outbreaks. I'm going to um, to do a few things. I'm going to give a little bit of a historical perspective on our understanding of trends in the emerging infectious diseases. Talk to you a little bit about how do we learn about um, infectious disease outbreaks, why it's important to learn about them quickly and 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 early. And I'm going to do a lot of this through the lens of ProMed, the Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases, which um, uses um, non-traditional sources, including media and social media and, and sort of firsthand reports um, as, uh, as a means of, of reporting and detecting outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases. Um, so I'm going to start historically. Um, this, um, this is the uh, CDC's publication, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports, and this is from, from 1981. So we're moving back in time here, and this is reporting on an outbreak of pneumocystis pneumonia occurring in, in gay men in Los Angeles. And uh, this was the first public report of a huge outbreak, of course, that, that, that we all know today as the HIV-AIDS um, epidemic 
which has spread globally, affected millions, um, and um, certainly is a major public health and, and medical issue, which continues to this day. And um, it was detected because this cluster of, of young men in Los Angeles got sick and needed a drug that was only available from the Centers for Disease Control, pentamidine. And um, an astute observer noticed why, you know, this is, this is not the usual population that gets this illness. Um, what's going on here? And, uh, and they um, astutely reported it, and a couple of years later, the causative agent HIV was discovered. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go in, into a long detail about that. But this, of course, was not the beginning of HIV, the disease. This was not the beginning. This was, these were not the first cases of AIDS. AIDS had probably been around for at least 30 years when, when this outbreak was detected. Um, HIV had been found in tissue samples in the U.S. going back to 69, plasma from the Congo in 1959, um, and, and an evolutionary model from looking at the sort of biological clock of the HIV virus it suggests that it emerged or transferred to humans um, in the 1930s. So it had been with us for quite a long time, and yet, and, and as we all know, this is not a subtle disease. This is not a disease that you could see and easily miss or forget, and yet we knew nothing about it. And, and why, why is that, and why was that? Um, and why wasn't it detected, you know, it, years earlier? Um, so I'm going gonna, uh, gonna to be a little unfair to um, William Stewart, the uh, 1969 U.S. Surgeon General. To the, this, this quote has often been attributed to him, but I, I can't find it written down anywhere. And in fact, many people say that he never said this. And Dr. Stewart did many good things. He started the anti-smoking campaign. And I don't want to besmirch his name, but I use this because this reflects what was a prevailing attitude of the time that infectious diseases did not really matter so much anymore. We had really conquered them. Um, this, this, is a, this is a real quote. This is from one of the you know, fathers of infectious disease, the clinical specialty of infectious disease, president of the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, a, you know, a, a learned man of medicine, who, um, who said that uh, he really couldn't figure out why we would need to have infectious disease as a, as a medical specialty anymore because, again, this was going to go away. And this was into, into the late 1970s now. Um, and if you look at... at um, the history of infectious diseases, it's easy to understand their optimism um, at that time. That, you know, going from, from a case, a, a, a crude case rate of 800 per 100,000 infectious disease mortality at the turn of the last century down to nearly vanishing by, by, the, by the 1970s and 80s, you can understand why they thought that infectious diseases were going away. And this is, by the way, this is when I trained and went to medical school, and, um, and this was certainly an attitude that was not uncommon, even, um, even at that time. Um, so there's one other, one other quote is that um, you can't, <coughs> what has happened does not always predict what will happen. And, uh, what, and by, by the 1990s, there was a recognition that, in fact, um, microbes were, were with us, that emerging infectious diseases were going to continue to be an issue and a problem um, and uh, weren't going to go away. The first Institute of Medicine report on emerging infections was published in 1992 with um, a lot of um, input from Josh Lederberg, who I was talking about with, uh, with Dr. Steen earlier. And, and other people who, who recognized that, um, that microbes were, were um, very um, hardy and very able to mutate. And um, Dr. Lederberg was fond of saying that it was a battle of um, our wits against their genes because of their ability to, um, to evolve and mutate and have short lifespans. And by, by the 1990s, um, the, the, we had sort of come around and realized that infectious diseases weren't going to go away. But it was easy to understand how an infectious disease could be missed. If you're not looking for something, you're not going to find it. You're not going to see it. 
Um, so by, by 1993, Ruth Berkelman and, and Jim Hughes were writing, um, you know, The Conquest of Infectious Diseases, which we people seriously talked about the conquest of infectious diseases as if this was a battle we could win. Um, and, you know, who are we kidding? And, and I think that that's a, a much more realistic view. Um, so people who were smarter than me, this is Jack Woodall, um, Barbara Hatch Rosenberg, and Steve Morse. Um, we're, we're very clever in recognizing two things that were going on in the 1990s. One was this um, rise in the recognition of emerging infectious diseases helped by HIV and Legionnaire's disease and some newly emerging cholera moving back into Latin America, other things that had happened um, that, that, that showed them that infectious diseases weren't going away, and also recognizing the use of uh, the, the growth of the Internet and you've got to remember that in the 1990s, you know, regular people were just starting to have email and it would moved out of kind of national laboratories and a few research universities into the mainstream and people could actually um, get and receive email and it was also moving into other countries and including the developing world. So around that time they started ProMed and it's a follow on of a of a bioweapons conference, actually, that was um, sponsored by the Federation of American Scientists and the World Health Organization. And they started this internal mailing list with 40 people um, just to tell each other about news of bioweapons. And they quickly realized that bioweapons could not really be distinguished. A biological attack can't really be distinguished from a natural outbreak, and that outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases were, were just kind of a natural um, act of bioterrorism. And they founded um, ProMed Mail, the program for monitoring emerging diseases. They founded it in 1994, and it was and still is a, a system of moderated email lists. It uh, has and had a, a website, and we now um, also branch out to social media. So I'm going to talk about social media some, both as a way of disseminating information and also about learning about disease outbreaks, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. ProMed is free. We have about 70,000 subscribers and essentially representing every country in the world. And the, it's, it's a mailing list in some senses, but it's really more like a social network. Um, this is a way that in, infectious people who are interested in emerging diseases can communicate with each other. Um, there is an emphasis on One Health that I'll talk about briefly later, the, the uh, notion that animal and eco-health are important in emerging diseases. And I'll also talk about a system of regional um, ProMed networks that now are out there. But I'm going to use this really as a, as a way of talking about some disease emergences and how we learn about them more than I'm going to talk about it. This is uh, the, the ProMed website. Um, it's a very useful tool for those of you who don't use it. Um, it's a way of getting information daily. It's a way, there's a, a an archive of, of Oh, going back to 1994, maybe 50, 60,000 um, reports of emerging diseases that can be searched by free text and by date and disease and species affected and so forth. So you can find out historically about um, emerging diseases as well. And um, all of this is, 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 um, is linked. It's also, as I mentioned, available on Facebook and Twitter and other, other ways. ProMed has about 50 people who operate it. Um, they're located throughout the world, and m for the most part, ProMed functions virtually. We use um, email and web tools to, to generate our, our reports. And as I mentioned, there are a system of regional networks of, of ProMed. These are kind of semi-autonomous, regional-based systems that are similar to ProMed. They're meant for communicating disease outbreak information um, of interest in the regions um, where, where they exist, which are often less well served in terms of infrastructure and information resources, but are often hotspots for disease emergence. So um, Latin America, Southeast Asia, the uh, African continent, both in English and French, um, the former Soviet Union, um, the Middle East, North Africa, and, and South Asia are two new networks which we've just brought on board and are, are just growing. So these, these don't just rebroadcast or translate ProMed reports. These are of and for people in the, those regions who operate these networks sort of with our editorial guidance and infrastructure support. But they exist autonomously and carry m 
um, often different information than ProMed. So I'm going to fast forward um, about um, 20 years from the first outbreak that I showed you to another outbreak. Um, this one was a, a, um, an outbreak of pneumonia that was happening in southern China. And we learned about this from, from, as we learn about much of our information, from one of our subscribers. As I say, ProMed is a two-way network, a social network, if you will. And he um, asked if we, if we had heard about an epidemic in uh, Guangzhou. Um, someone from a teacher's chat room lived there and reports that hospitals uh, have been closed there and um, people are dying. And uh, this came to our attention. We opined about it. At the time, there was a lot of interest in um, avian influenza. H5N1 had recently been discovered, and we wondered if this could be the long-awaited um, human outbreak of um, avian influenza. Um, but we didn't know. And uh, we put it out there, and, and, and soon after, um, everybody learned. By, by the 12th of March, um, the WHO had issued a global alert about cases of atypical pneumonia. And um, this, this was the um, SARS outbreak. This was the beginning of the SARS outbreak. But prior to the 12th of March, um, a week earlier than, than the WHO had announced this outbreak to the world, um, there were already people appearing in Canada. There had already been deaths due to um, SARS in, in Toronto. And uh, how did the people there know about SARS? Well, they knew about it from informal sources of information, sources like ProMed and other sources that I'll tell you more about later, but not through the formal public health system, but through um, informal reporting systems. Now, I put this up for a couple of reasons. The first is to just show what the, the, the epidemiologic curve or epi curve of SARS looked like. Um, there were cases going back to at least the fall of 2002, human cases retrospectively recognized in, in rural Guangdong. And then there had been this, this peak in February, which was when um, ProMed um, first posted on it. Let's see if I can bring that up. The index case back here, the first ProMed report here. And, um, and as you can see, it went on to affect thousands of people in, in, in 20 countries. About 20% of the cases occurred in healthcare workers, which is probably reminiscent of some of the other um, diseases we've been hearing about recently. Um, and here is where the uh, WHO, oh, I'm sorry, the first Canadian case back here in March, and then the WHO report. But um, why do we care about, why do we want to learn about outbreaks early? And um, I think this is important, and I hope that this curve can, can help illustrate that. What it, so because SARS, like Ebola, like MERS, like many diseases, there's no, um, there's no drug, there's no vaccine. The, this is contained using traditional public health means, like isolation and quarantine and, um, and, and keeping people from spreading the disease between each other's traditional public health measures. So, if you can intervene, if you could have intervened here or here, then perhaps you could have prevented much of the later part of the outbreak. You could control, contain, minimize, or even eliminate the epidemic. And maybe instead of an epi curve that looked like this, we could have seen an epi curve that looked like this and prevented thousands of cases of this disease from occurring. So that's why, why it's important to know early. That's why it's important to have an early warning so that we can intervene with public health interventions. How do we learn about outbreaks? So I, as, as um, Dr. Steen mentioned, I, I, I'm a, I, I sit somewhere around here. I'm a, um, a state public health official in Massachusetts. And we have a very robust public health system um, in many parts of the world, not, in, not everywhere, but in many parts of the world, there's a very robust public health system where information about disease comes from the public, from practitioners, from um, private and public uh, health laboratories, and this filters through to local health and regional and state public health officials up to the ministry, the CDC level, and eventually to world bodies like WHO. 
Um, but as you can imagine, there, so, so, so this is a great system in many ways. Um, but you can also imagine ways in which this system isn't perfect. For example, what happens if um, somebody forgets or has a disincentive from, for reporting an outbreak? And there are many kinds of disincentives for reporting an outbreak. It can damage industry and tourism and agriculture. Um, it can make you look bad. You know, something happened on your watch, it's not good. Um, and also, um, it, it's slow. You can imagine the time it takes from information to filter through these layers. Um, in addition, if a disease is not a reportable disease, is not recognized as something that needs to be reported, then it isn't reported. So if something is happening but there's no box to check on the case report form, or it's not on a list of notifiable diseases, it may never be reported. And uh, maybe this was the case with HIV. There was a mysterious disease that was killing people, but there was nothing. Who did you tell? What, what, how did you tell people about it? There wasn't a, a case report form for HIV because there was no such thing. So these are the advantages and the disadvantages, and I've sort of alluded to them already, of traditional public health. It's robust and sensitive. It's accurate. It's validated. It's quantitative. But it also can be slow. There are incentives for non-reporting. There can be broken links in the chain that result in something never being reporting. It can, it can miss uncharacterized or novel disease. And of course, it's expensive. Um, traditional public health in this country, you know, it's cheap compared to the health care system, but it still costs billions of dollars. So what has developed in the 20 or so years since ProMed has been around, ProMed is now celebrating its 20th anniversary, is um, a system of, of informal surveillance, or, or what the WHO now calls event-based surveillance, or biosurveillance. And this is a system that monitors non-traditional sources of information, so things that we don't always think of as health data, like the media, like social media, like school absenteeism, purchases from pharmacies, things that are not necessarily part of the, of, of the health system and yet can inform us about um, public health events and can help us detect things rapidly and early. So informal source surveillance systems like ProMed talk to, and you notice these, the, the, the um, bi-directional arrows here, talk to and, and receive information from the media, from laboratories, from local health officials, from anybody with an email account, um, from healthcare workers, and of course from ministries of health. And, and they in turn disseminate this information widely um, so, that, so that people learn about it. So the advantages of, of this kind of a system are, are that it's rapid. That, it, that it's transparent because there aren't any disincentives for, 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 for reporting things. You can use any kind of a source of information. Uh, you can identify any kind of event regardless of whether it has a name or a diagno diagnosis or an etiologic agent. And it's relatively inexpensive to operate these kinds of systems. Now there are disadvantages. These systems can potentially be inaccurate, right? You can amplify misinformation or disinformation. Um, they're not necessarily quantitative. This is not a system for counting how many cases of influenza there are or how many cases of salmonella occur in a jurisdiction in a year. This is a way of finding out that there's an outbreak of influenza or salmonella, but not of knowing how many cases there are and whether they're laboratory confirmed um, and there are biases inherent in this kind of a system. So places that have a lot of information tend to convey this information publicly and get it rebroadcast and, re, re, and, and, and amplified. Um, until pretty recently, the Internet was largely in English, and that's something that has changed, you know, in the last five to ten years, but it's still changing. And um, it, it's, there still is not the um, richness in many languages that there is in English. Obviously, things can get sensationalized as well. Um, one thing that happened in, in 2005, um, probably, the, now these, the, the, the World Health Assembly meets and develops what are called the International Health Regulations on, periodically. 
And um, these had not been revised in many years. Starting back in the 90s, there was an effort to um, rewrite the international health regulations, which had actually required countries only to report on cholera, yellow fever, and plague. And um, if, if a country did not have one of those diseases to report, smallpox was also on the list but was eliminated, um, then it, there was no requirement for that country to report it to the World Health Organization. Now, the world, many did, and the World Health Organization, of course, responded to many things. But these revised international health regulations, which I think were, were um, hastened by the SARS epidemic, um, so that the World Health Assembly actually adopted them in 2005 and they took effect in 2007. For the first time, countries were obligated to notify WHO of any public health event of international significance or international concern. And uh, not, not a particular set of diseases, but anything that could be um, in an international problem. It also, for the first time, allowed WHO to think about unofficial sources of information. Now, WHO is composed of its member countries, and so under its existing regulation, it was really only allowed to think about something, to learn about something from a member country telling it about an event. Now it's allowed to and encouraged to use unofficial reports. And as I mentioned, they are now encouraging member countries to adopt informal biosurveillance systems, not unlike ProMed and, and, and similar. So just want to mention that. Another thing that I, I want to talk about briefly in regards to emerging infectious diseases is the importance of One Health. So One Health is a concept that's been around for at least 100 years at this point. It was you know, certainly something that Virchow, one of the you know, fathers of, of pathology, classical German pathology, talked about and Osler talked about. He, he, he used the term One Medicine, and we've mo more recently adopted the idea of One Health. But basically, it, it thinks about disease without regards to species boundaries. And it recognizes that we, that it, a, a more ecological approach to health, that we depend on the health of the environment and the animals around us and, and vice versa. That there, there really is a, you can't look at human health without looking at animal health and vice versa. And um, so people have called this eco-health or one health, but it's, a, it's become a, an increasingly important um, movement and, and certainly it's something that ProMed has recognized and embraced since its founding. Um, so I'm gonna, so I, I, I'm gonna I, a little bit of um, research I wanna present to you for a minute. This is work that was done by Mark Woolhouse in the United Kingdom. And he actually looked at all of the human pathogens he could find, all of, the, all of the named human pathogens he could find. He found 1,407 of them. And he noted that 58% of them are zoonotic, meaning that the, the microorganism that is shared by at least one other species, not just humans. But if you looked at the recently emerged diseases, um, 130 of 177 recently emerged diseases were zoonotic. So there was about a twofold relative risk of a zoonotic disease emerging. And if you think about the Im important emerging infectious diseases that would fall off your tongue, Ebola, MERS, SARS, um, HIV, um, salmonellosis, rabies, um, you know, all, virtually uh, many, many of the diseases, anthrax, that we think about are zoonotic diseases. They're diseases that occur in animals, importantly in animals. And, um, and often humans are just a kind of a, a side route and you know, not even the most important um, host of, of these pathogens. But if you, and, and, and those pathogens, it turns out, are much more likely to emerge. And this looks at um, the host range of a pathogen and it's subdivided here by different types of pathogens. So if a, if a, if a, if a microorganism has only human pathogen, we say that you know, that's its host range. If it's shared with one other species, two other species, or more than three species, you can see that its risk of emergence increases. This is particularly true for viruses, because probably because of their capability to mutate and evolve rapidly. But it's really true of almost everything, and I think if you had enough examples, it would be true of everything. That zoonotic pathogens are much more likely to emerge, and that's why 
ProMed spends so much of its time looking at and thinking about animal diseases to the point where a lot of our human readers say things like, you know, I really don't want to hear about foot and mouth disease or blue tongue or, you know, this, this, uh, uh, you know, wheat rust, because we also report on plant diseases. But, but it's really um, important to stay attuned to those things because that's where the next uh, disease emergence is going to be from. Um, ProMed was the first to report on the uh, novel coronavirus um, isolated in Saudi Arabia. And I'm going to talk about this for a couple of reasons, because um, this was an example of a disease that was reported to us not from, not from uh, media or social media, but from um, a laboratory, actually. This was an astute laboratorian, um, Dr. Uh, Zaki, working in a, a hospital in Jeddah, who identified a novel coronavirus from, from a patient there. And uh, he had it, he sequenced it in conjunction with a laboratory in, in Europe and um, put the result out there in ProMed, frankly, because he was frustrated with how long it was taking for an official report of this to come out. And so this is a way of letting people know about something without having to go through all of the official um, processes that are sometimes necessary. And so, so I put up this next slide because it, it was a good thing he did put it out when he did. If you look back here, he put this out on, um, on the um, 20th of September. And by the 23rd of September, um, physicians in the United Kingdom were reporting on a similar case. They read this report and they said, hey, we've got a very sick patient from the Middle East and we don't know what he's got. All of our laboratory tests were negative. And it turned when they were when we read his report, they tested him for coronavirus and found out that indeed it was MERS. Now, another side effect of the informal system of reporting is that it often encourages official reports to follow quickly, because once you know, and I work as I say, I work in a state health department. I understand the barriers to telling everybody everything right away, but once something is out there, it's a lot easier to tell people. So once something is already public information, it, it, it's then possible for the Ministry of Health to confirm that and to say, yes, yes, we know about that. We, we, we're on top of this, and we've, um, and, and we've also seen some cases, and this is what we're doing about it. And that's what happened in Saudi Arabia. Quickly after the initial ProMed reports, the Saudi government issued, um, issued public reports acknowledging the existence of um, of MERS, what, what came to be known as the MERS coronavirus or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. Um, one other thing I want to say about ProMed is it's a, it, it's a forum for people to ask questions. So when the MERS um, incident became public, one of our readers, a woman named Irene Lai, who works for SOS International, um, said, I'd be interested to know whether this outbreak of severe respiratory disease that we saw in Jordan in April of 2012 could have been MERS. And she was right, in fact. That, that was the beginning, that, that was the, now we think this is the earliest known human cases of MERS occurred in a hospital cluster in Jordan back in 2012. So just as another way of illustrating how informal sources of information outside of the government sector can, can be important. I mentioned the growth of the internet and, um, and, and why that matters, but um, and and it has also allowed this kind of ecosystem of informal, um, event-based biosurveillance systems to flourish. And um, I, I didn't want. I, I certainly don't want you to come away from this thinking that ProMed is the answer or is, a, is the only system that does this. But um, there are a number of, of systems that GFIN was the first um, web mining tool. Um, developed by the Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada at the time. And it actually still exists and it goes out and it scans the web many times a day and finds um, outbreak reports. Health Map uses a similar system, but it uses a ge geographically based um, method for, for finding out where outbreaks are and mapping them in, in near real time. And these are a number of other um, systems that are both official and unofficial and formal and informal that do the same kinds of things that I'm, that I'm telling you about that 
um, look at informal sources of information, st information outside of the health sector for trying to identify um, early public health events. The problem um, with this and with, with many sources of information is that there's, there's, there's a lot of information out there. This, um, this is a, a, a um, graph from The Economist showing just the um, amount of information, I believe in, yes, this is an, a, a, a unit that I can't even tell you what it means, exabytes of information, um, and uh, just telling you what the, looking at the volume in exabytes of information. And the effect of this is a, is a, is a fire hose of, of information. How do you make sense of it? How do you find in that stream of information the things that are of interest to you? Now, ProMed uses a combination of methods. We're very, we work very closely with HealthMap, as I mentioned before. HealthMap mines the web for um, information on infectious diseases. ProMed uses people, um, human beings, to look at all of this information and filter it and decide what's important and group things together and comment on it and, and put it out there. Other systems use, use other ways of looking at, at large amounts of information. So I, I, I couldn't give this talk without at least talking about Ebola. Um, this was from the New York Times, I guess, two days ago um, with a CDC um, giving an outside estimate of one and a half million cases of Ebola. Again, um, this was probably a missed opportunity. And one, if you think back to that epi curve, um, if we could have intervened effectively at an earlier time on this epi curve, we would not be seeing the kind of um, exponential growth in the epidemic that we're seeing now. Um, I, this, I, 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 I put this up, I, you know, and I was a little hesitant to show this cartoon because I certainly don't want to make light of, of Ebola in any way. Um, but this, Roz Chast published this cartoon in The New Yorker in uh, 2001. And um, this is a, a, a woman um, dealing with her insomnia, what, what, what things she was thinking about in her, um, in her inability to sleep. And right up number two is Ebola. And uh, number three says, why, why am I obsessing about Ebola? There's no Ebola on 33rd Street yet. And, um, and it is just to tell you that I think this was very prescient. <laughs> this was a, uh, she was uh, ahead of her time in recognizing how much worry, and again, speaking with my state health department hat on how much time we've spent worrying about Ebola in Massachusetts is, is a testimony to, to how right she was. Um, this, again, was the first uh, media report that we found about Ebola. This was back in, in March of, uh, of 2014. We think the index case was probably in late 2013, but it came to media attention. Somebody first used the word Ebola in association with this outbreak in a media report. So I also want to acknowledge that much of what ProMed reports is from traditional media, from newspapers and, and magazines and other material that's out there on the in internet. Um, journalists are, are doing a lot of good work for us and um, they're uncovering outbreaks often, you know, before they're named or identified. And this was, you know, could this be Ebola? Um, one of the important um, attributes of a ProMed report is that it comes with moderator comments. All of our reports are read and reviewed and commented on by a subject matter expert. And um, this particular um, subject matter expert no noted the, the line in this that most of the victims had been in contact with the deceased or had handled bodies was very characteristic of hemorrhagic fever viruses in Africa. And um, there were, she mentioned other hemorrhagic fever viruses. This is our deputy editor, Marjorie Pollock, who, who wrote this commentary. And it was very um, um, astute for her to, to pick up on this, um, on this. Now, ProMed has gone on, has published, it's, this was now two days ago, so we're probably up to report number 175. So it's a good way of capturing on a daily basis a summary of what's going on, um, on in, in, in Ebola. Um, this is um, Health Map, a website that I mentioned, and I'm going to talk about a few other um, ways in which um, informal source information is mined for public health use. Health Map is very good at this, and as I say, they're close collaborators with um, ProMed, and uh, they also picked up very early um, reports of, of Ebola or hemorrhagic fever out this hemorrhagic fever outbreak 
and reported on it. Um, and you can use their website, healthmap.org, to follow the outbreak again in more or less real time. Twitter is a very <laughs> good way and one that I often hear about outbreaks for the, for the first time. And again, a tribute to you know, good journalists. Helen Branswell is one of my favorite reporters. Marin McKenna, another great reporter, but also official, as you know, organizations like WHO and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and ProMed also have um, Twitter accounts, and it's a convenient, real-time way of following this. But in addition to that, what happens on Twitter um, can often be uh, an early warning of outbreaks. And so this was work by um, Alessio Signorini at the University of Iowa um, looking at Twitter as a predictor. So these were just, this was just a very simple, this was um, reported versus predicted weekly ILIs in the 2009-2010 flu season. And he was looking at um, predicted reports based on Twitter versus reported disease. And you can see that even that the Twitter reports mentioning influenza very closely followed or perhaps even preceded the um, reports, the official reports of influenza-like illness. Um, our colleagues at HealthMap used um, Twitter in Haiti, um, Twitter reports from Haiti to follow um, the cholera outbreak that has been happening there that unfortunately continues to, ha to, to, to occur there and showed that in fact um, Twitter reports preceded um, the actual case count so that there was actually a peak in reporting of diarrheal disease that preceded by a couple of weeks um, actual public health reports of disease. So again, this was simply using publicly available information from Twitter looking for terms that were suggestive of, of um, cholera from people in Haiti and they were able to use that information to predict. Something as simple as without even monitoring the content or the telephone numbers that are called from a, from a phone, just looking at the number of hits a cell phone tower is having can tell you that something is happening. Now, it can't necessarily identify what that event is, but patterns of cell phone use can identify in real time or near real time an event that's happening. And this is, again, this was um, work um, well, by Nathan Eagle and colleagues on cell phone usage patterns in Kenya and just showing that, um, that, that hot spots of cell phone use could tell you if an event was going on in that area. Google Flu Trends is something that you've probably seen or are familiar with is another um, very clever tool um, that looks for search terms. And it turns out that when people are searching for influenza or other terms that might suggest that they're sick with influenza, this is a very good predictor of influenza activity. And they showed that and showed that, the, that Google Flu Trends activity very closely paralleled um, CDC um, volume of influenza. Could also be applied to dengue, and the same um, trend has been used. So, that, so that using the so-called search stream, what people are searching for and where they are can, can be a very informative um, piece of information. Markets um, can, can also predict um, events. So when a, when a stock market crashes or, or, um, or booms, it can, it can indicate that something is about to happen. Um, and uh, people have exploited that phenomena by looking, by using market-based approaches to predicting or, or monitoring emerging disease outbreaks. If you um, can impanel people who know a lot about avian influenza or influenza and ask them um, for money <laughs> to bet on, essentially, to, to, to buy and sell shares in a market on what they think is going to happen to flu, um, it, it can predict it can, it can be a leading indicator of what's likely to happen with influenza. This was a colleague, Phil Polgreen, who um, demonstrated this in Iowa, or the Iowa prediction markets. Now, the Iowa prediction markets you may have heard of are frequently used to predict um, election outcomes and um, were often followed during the last presidential election. But they can also predict flu outbreaks. If you ask people, this, it's a way of aggregating expert opinion 
in a way that's more than asking somebody, what do you think is going to happen, but how much money are you willing to put on that um, proposition? And uh, that's a, a way of, of aggregating um, expert opinion and able to monitor and, and exploit. So does this work? Um, do all these tools, have they helped? And the answer is they seem to. If you, you, this was work that I did with colleagues at HealthMap, looking at the time to outbreak discovery and public communication of outbreaks. And we looked at this for, for widespread infectious disease outbreaks uh, that had been reported to WHO. And what we found is that the time um, to outbreak discovery and the time to public communication of an outbreak had declined steadily from uh, 1996 to 2009, the study, the study period, which we believe corresponds to a period when this kind of activity was going on. Can we prove the relationship? No, but I think it's a reasonable um, supposition. You'll also notice what I think is the either the SARS effect or the IHR effect that, when, that seemed to accelerate the trend towards more rapid public reporting of outbreaks. As I mentioned, there are a number of systems out there that do biosurveillance. Um, this slide makes a case for um, the benefits of redundancy, the benefits of synergy, if you will, that if you look at any given system, the time to outbreak detection, and, and in this case, higher is better. Um, the number of days before official notification is plotted on the, on the um, vertical axis here. So if you combine systems, you can find out about outbreaks faster than any individual system is capable of doing. So this makes the case for synergy from multiple surveillance systems. Finally, I just want to say that it's important um, not to focus too much on any one thing. At the moment, you know, we're paying a lot of attention, for example, to Ebola. Um, but it may be that the next, the next thing that we need to worry about I I is over here. And so you need to, um, we need to keep our eyes on the horizon, not just in the uh, telescope. So I'll really stop here. I've said all of these things, um, and uh, I want to acknowledge our supporters um, who have uh, supported ProMed and its work. And uh, I'll stop there. And there's a, there's a, a, a meeting that ProMed is involved in, in uh, for those of you who are interested in this, that happens on beginning on Halloween in uh, Vienna. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions or Any questions? Discussion. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, yeah, please. Yes. I, uh, uh, I noticed that, um, or I will say I missed it, you didn't use the buzzword big data in your um, talk, <laughs> and just, but I'm just wondering whether, I mean, clearly a number of these things are potentially could benefit from you know, large scale analytics, and I assume this involves in some of them, but um, can you say anything about what's happening? So the question was, um, um, how does big data play into this? And I didn't use the term, but I certainly alluded to the, uh, the, the, the huge volume of, of data, the huge and accumulating volume of data. And, um, and yes, absolutely, the, these kinds of things can be useful. And I think some of the examples I use, like the search stream, is certainly an example of using big data. You know, um, excuse me one second. Um, hundreds of millions of Google users entering search terms is a, is a form of big data. Cell phone, aggregate cell phone usage is a form of, of, of big data. So absolutely, big data um, a, a, can be mined, but as a, and, and again, it alludes to the, the slide that I showed of the fire hose of information. The trick in using big data is using it intelligently and using it in a way that um, is selective and, um, and, and can provide useful information. Otherwise, it's just lots of data. And, and yes, absolutely, if ProMed wanted to um, um, put a report out on every time somebody had a case of um, salmonella, just to keep harping on salmonella, but there, you know, there are thousands of cases of salmonella, it's not, it wouldn't be particularly interesting. The trick is in recognizing when there's a, a, an outbreak when there's an aggregation, when there's something that ties those cases together. 
Um, and uh, so the, 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 the magic in using big data, if you will, is in trying to use it intelligently. And that's not easy. And it's, uh, it's uh, that, that there are a lot of people who are smarter than me that spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I think that it's very likely, um, certainly um, the kinds of work that ProMed does, we get a lot of data and we report only a little bit of it. But um, human, a human-centered approach is really only one approach, and there are, are, have got to be other, um, other approaches. And we're working with some, some partners um, that, that, are, that are, are using these kind of approaches. There's a, I mentioned in my acknowledgments, USAID the, um, has, a, has a program called the Emerging, Pandemics Threat, Emerging Pandemic Threats Program, which is attempting to use lots and lots of data and aggregating it in intelligent ways, including um, things like um, looking for people who are in contact with animals to see if they're sick, looking at their at their serum to see if there are signatures in that in in blood and that sort of thing. We're doing some work with the um, Defense Threat Reduction Agency um, in in trying to combine into a single platform lots of data sources to try to make them available again to human analysts so that they can um, try to interpret the vast amount of data that, that are out there. I mean, a lot of what you're talking about, the different systems are potentially um, could uh, you know, contribute to a, a meta-analytical meta approach. You know, and you mentioned that, you know, being able to combine information would lead, lead you with, to more, you know, at least post hoc predictive power, if you will. And the question is, in terms of real time, are there attempts, it sounds like there are attempts Yes. Uh, I was, yeah, so the question is, are there analytic systems that are trying to do this, trying to combine data in real time? Um, yeah, and and um, not yet <laughs> that I've that at least that I've heard about successfully, but there are certainly um, many uh, many people working in that space. Other questions? Yeah, please. So, so I think your question is um, how can can you use data to make predictions about what's going to happen or to analyze um, what's happening? Right. I you know I think um, so. I, I would say two things. I, <laughs> two, the predictions are hard to make. <laughs> Um, especially about the future, I think that was Yogi Berra who said that. That, uh, um, and 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 I think that's that's obviously true. You can look at data, and two people can look at the same data and make different predictions. Um, I talked a little bit about um, predictive analytics, um, things that look at data as as at least a, perhaps not a prediction, but a leading indicator, something that happens before. Um, our other systems, you know, so maybe saying that the flu is going to happen um, a week ahead of when lab tests show that there's flu may not be because you're predicting the future. It may be because you're using something faster than a flu test, you know, because it takes time for someone to go to the doctor. It takes time for someone to do the test. So one of the, um, I think one of the very innovative approaches is called participatory surveillance where people actually monitor themselves and say, you know, I think I'm getting the flu and can do that on a website or a cell phone app and that data are, those data are aggregated in a way that, that's intelligent. Um, the, the, the other thing to say is that I think those, 
a lot of this needs to be demonstrated. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I think that's that's what science is, right? Is that we need to be able to, you know, we can have a hypothesis that data will help us predict or analyze or or see things earlier, but we have to show it. It's it's on on us as researchers to be able to demonstrate that, and um, I think that's happening, but less than you know. There's a lot more enthusiasm than there are um, good data. You had a, about 50 spots in the world. Uh, those people are expert or physician or who, who are they? So, so, so uh, Dr. Steen asked who the personnel that were on the ProMed staff map are. So the, they are, they're different kinds of people. F um, for the most part, they're subject matter experts in different things. Some of them are part of our, our, our um, regional network system. So, you know, consciously, I think if there are people in a region, they're going to be more aware of what's happening in that region than people outside of that region. So some of them are regional experts. They're all health specialists in some form or another. Some are virologists, parasitologists, animal health people. They're, they're different kinds of, of, of experts out there, but they're all um, experts. And I should mention that um, ProMed staff are all paid a little something. They, they get an honorarium for their, their work, but we don't pay, they're, they're really volunteers. They don't earn, I mean, they don't earn what, they, they don't make what they earn <laughs> in a sense. They're, they're um, underpaid, but they're, they're, they're all over the world and they all participate in this network. Is there a special selection for these people? Yes, we, we're very selective about who we bring on board as a ProMed moderator. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I'll, 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 one minute, yeah. Uh, yeah, just following on from that, um, have you, what's the concentration of subscribers in West Africa, I guess first question, and then second question is, does ProMed actively recruit um, people in areas where maybe there's lacking or in hot spots that maybe don't have a lot of subscribers? Right, yeah, so, so the, really the goal of the regional networks is to, um, is, is to improve surveillance for the people in, in those regions. It's secondarily to improve surveillance for the rest of the world, but really its primary goal is cross-border and, and, and regional surveillance for people to be more aware of what's going on in that region. Um, I, 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 I have numbers somewhere. I don't have off the top of my head. Most of our subscribers are, are in the north, if you will. They're in, they're in English-speaking, they're in the U.S. and, and Western Europe and Eng other English-speaking developed countries, but we have a large number of subscribers you know I think uh, there are over uh, there, there are over a thousand I believe that subscribe to our sp African specific services now not all of them are in Africa and some of our subscribers to the global list are, are in Africa we do have that we, we do have data on where our subscribers live I should point out that a lot of people don't necessarily get our emails they come to our website or they follow us on Twitter or Facebook um, and get the same reports, but they don't we don't necessarily have their email address. But there are thousands of people in those areas that are that, that are, are making themselves make, make use of it. And we know that from from email addresses that many of those people are in government or regional or local or international um, public health in some form or another. And many are not. Many are, are you know clinicians or individuals in those regions who are just interested. Journalists, for example. Right, so, so that again is a reason for our regional networks is to try to build interest in, in a region, to try to let people in a region because these people are there and they're going to meetings and they have colleagues and they're on Facebook and they can tell their friends and, and, uh, and so forth, their, their co-workers about ProMed. So that's, that's really our effort. Um, you know, beyond that, all we have is email. <laughs> So we're so so just to speak of ProMed. Um, ProMed is using it primarily though, is using social media as a means of dissemination. So we have about you know three or four thousand people who who like us on on Facebook and and that's a way of getting our posts. All of our posts are pushed to our Facebook page, so someone could like us on Facebook and it'll show up in their news feed on Facebook. Um, the same with Twitter. We primarily use Twitter. We have about 4,000 followers on Twitter 
who just receive our posts via Twitter, and each tweet has a link to the full report. It just has a headline. You know, all of our, our reports have a kind of a stylized headline. You know, Ebola, West Africa, Guinea, and uh, and then if they want to learn more, they can click on it, and it takes them to a web page. But so we so through social media, we reach about another eight or nine thousand people. But it's for for us, it's mostly passive. We do, you know, it's something we'd like to build on, but we haven't had the bandwidth to do that yet. We, we are not trying to use it to monitor disease in the way some of the, the other work that I described is doing, but that's not, that's not something that I'm currently working on. So, the, so I, I think the, so the question is about DNA and using DNA to track outbreaks or something well, like that to, to right. follow outbreaks. So the closest thing, you know, the closest thing that I can relate to, to what you're saying would be the use of um, DNA sequences from pathogens. And so, you know, and that, that can be very important. That can help you establish a connection in an outbreak. If, you know, if you have multiple people with the same pathogen and they have the same DNA fingerprint, that can establish that those cases are related. Um, in the Ebola outbreak in um, West Africa, there were sequences done of the outbreak strains in West Africa and sequences done from the strains in Congo, and they were sufficiently similar to say that they were related, but sufficiently different to say that they weren't they weren't directly related. The outbreak didn't spread from West Africa to Congo or vice versa. That there that they were that there was the same strain, but it was a different outbreak, and so DNA information. And I think it also speaks to the need for transparency because there's a lot of um, of, of scientists who want to keep private their DNA sequences until they've published it or until everybody knows about it. And I think that may not be the best way of doing it. So ProMed has always been in favor of transparency in DNA sequencing of pathogens. So if somebody knows an avian flu strain's genetic signature, yeah, that's important information. That might be important to someone, you know, that, that DNA from someone in Egypt might be important to someone in Thailand, say, you know, who both have the same strain of, of H5N1 that can tell how it got there or where it went. So I don't think I exactly answered your question, but hopefully I was at least in the, in the same uh, universe. Yeah, no, <laughs> okay. O 
I guess only if it were an infectious disease, if an infectious etiology were, were found for breast cancer, which is certainly within the realm of possibility, but, um, but that would be, we're, we're focused on, on emerging infectious diseases, um, right? So, okay. okay, please join me to thank the speaker. Thank, oh. thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you for your attention. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.